This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And if you don't mind, I'd like to suggest something that you might share with your friends. And that something is a glass of sherry before dinner. Naturally, a glass of Petri California sherry. I say Petri sherry because it's the perfect before dinner wine. You couldn't think of a better way to begin a meal. That Petri sherry has a beautiful, inviting color, like, like dark amber. And for flavor, well, you've heard sherry described many times as having a rich, nut-like flavor. But if you want to learn for the first time what those words, rich and nut-like, really mean, you just taste Petri sherry. It's wonderful. Serve Petri sherry by itself, or serve it with hors d'oeuvres, or, or those little cocktail sandwiches. And incidentally, if you prefer the sherry dry, you know, not sweet. Just ask your wine merchant for Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Well, the important thing to remember is if you want sherry, you want Petri Sherry, because that means good sherry. And now let's look in on our genial friend and good host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Punctual to the minute, as usual. (laughs) Never keep a doctor waiting, I always say. Particularly, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Draw up a chair, my boy. Thank you. That's it, that's it, that's it. All ready to tell us the Sherlock Holmes adventure of the speckled band, Doctor? Yes, I'm all ready, Mr. Bartow. Say, Doctor, just what does a speckled band mean? <laughs> you wait until I've told you the story, young fellow, my lad. You'll find out for yourself. <laughs> Sorry. The floor is all yours, Doctor. The adventure of the speckled band began on a rainy April morning in 1883. An urgent call from one of my patients had kept me up most of the night before, and in consequence, I came down to my breakfast rather later than usual to find that Holmes had already left our house some hours earlier. As I sat there reading the morning paper and consuming my two lightly boiled eggs, there was a knock at the door. It opened to disclose a typical example of the British working man, a bag of tools in one hand and a grimy cap in the other, as he spoke to me from the doorway. You sent for me, Mr. Holmes? I'm not, Mr. Holmes. Oh, beg your pardon, Governor. But I've come to mend the gas bracket over the mantelpiece. Oh? oh? What's wrong with it? I've got a leak in it. Oh, leak? Well, 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 what's wrong with your work? Yes, sir. Hope I won't be disturbing you, no, sir. No, no, no. That's all right, my man. Don't mind me. Don't mind me. Oh, dear. Very untidy, man, Mr. Holmes, sir. What do you mean by that? Well, you can't help noticing the mess this room's in. I've heard say he was as tidy as anyone he started. But he learned bad habits from a bloke what lived with him. Uh... Dr. Watson, I think his name is. You impertinent fellow. How dare you talk to me like that? I've got a good... Ma- oh, where does he go to? Here. You come out of there. That's Mr. Holmes's room. Don't be angry with me, Watson. What? Just slipping out of these grimy rags into a dressing gown. Good gracious me. So was you, Holmes. Well, upon my soul, I, I'd never recognized you, but <laughs> why the disguise? A case, my dear Watson, a case. One of those small problems which a trusting public occasionally confides to my investigation. Uh Uh-huh. To the British workman, old chap, all doors are open. His costume is unostentatious and his habits are sociable. Tool bag is an excellent passport and a tawny moustache will secure the, uh, (laughs) cooperation of maids. But what's the case, Holmes? A modest little drama of life in the kitchen, one of those seemingly inconsequential affairs, and yet, Watson... The honour of a duchess is at stake. Duchess? Uh, Mad world, my master, the mad world... Ah, now I feel a little more comfortable. Let's return to the sitting room, shall we? A strong cup of tea would be just acceptable. Oh, I wish you'd tell me about the Duchess and life in the kitchen home. Some other time, old fellow, some other time. At the moment, suppose you tell me what you know about Miss Helen Stoner. I received a letter from her this morning in which she informed me that she would be calling here at 11, and also that she was a friend of yours. Helen Stoner? Oh, yes, yes. A charming girl, indeed. Pour me a cup of tea, Watson, and tell me about her. Well, I befriended her... At the time of the tragic death of her sister two years ago, I told you about the case, don't you remember? The sudden death of Violet Stoner at an old house in Stoke Moran? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It all comes back to me now. There was a 
There was an inquest, wasn't there, with a string of stupid, ineffective witnesses? Ineffective? I was one of them. Oh, I'm sorry, old fellow. Then you were the exception, of course. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see. I docketed the evidence on the case. Where is it? Uh, my scrapbook. Ah, here we are, here we are. Let me see. Yes, S. S. Salisbury Hatchet Murder Lord St. Simon. Here we are, here we are. Stoke Moran. Yes, I remember the affair well now. The villain of the piece was Dr. Grimsby Roylet, wasn't he? Yes, a dreadful fellow. He's the stepfather of the two girls. Violet, the one that died so mysteriously. Helen, the one who's coming here to see you. Dr. Roylet has a pretty record. Fifty-five years of age, killed his kit McGar in India. Once in an insane asylum, married money, wife died. Distinguished surgeon. Well, Watson, hmm. I wonder what the distinguished surgeon has been up to now. You know, some deviltry, I fear. Why do you say that? You remember that this Violet Stoner's death followed close upon the announcement of her engagement? Yes. Well, I met Miss Helen Stoner on the streets a few weeks ago. She told me that she'd just become engaged to a young fellow in the army who was leaving for the Far East. She was very upset at the thought of being alone with her stepfather at, uh, at Stoke Moran. Oh, naturally it was. Hmm. Dr. Roylett stands to lose a considerable sum of money in the event of his stepdaughter's marriage. Yes, they both had a trust fund which he administered only as long as the girls were unmarried. That fact was brought out at the coroner's inquest two years ago. But if Roylett did poison the other stepdaughter, and I'm pretty convinced that he did, it seems unlikely that he'd try it again. Two sudden deaths in the same household could hardly pass the coroner. Oh, no, my dear Watson. You're making the mistake of putting your normal brain into Rolliot's abnormal bee. Oh, that, that must be Miss Stoner now. Yes, let me see. It's precisely 11 o'clock. Well, let's see what we can do for her. Well, I hope you can help her, Holmes. She's an extremely nice girl. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? There's a Miss Helen Stoner to see you, sir. She says she has an appointment. Show her in, please, Mrs. Hudson. Aye, sir. Come in, my dear. Thank you. Uh, Miss Stoner, I'm... I'm so glad to see you again. How do you do, Dr. Watson? And this must be your friend. Yes, Miss Stoner, I'm Sherlock Holmes. Sit down by the fire, won't you? Yes, yes, please do, my dear. Hello, you're... You're trembling with cold. It's not cold that makes me shiver. Tell me, Mr. Holmes, has my stepfather, Dr. Grimsby Roylett, been here? No, he hasn't. He saw me in the street. I dashed by him in a handsome cab, but he saw me. Our eyes met and he waved me to stop, but I came here as fast as I could. Very sensible move. Uh, Dr. Watson has already given me several hints as to your present problem as well as having refreshed my memory as to the circumstances of your sister's death. My problem is a simple enough one, Mr. Holmes. I'm... I'm waiting to be murdered. No, 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 my uh, dear girl... Please be a trifle more explicit, Miss Turner. Very well, Mr. Holmes. My fiancé is leaving for the Far East today. When he leaves, I shall be alone with my stepfather at Stoke Moran. He plans to murder me just as he murdered my sister. What makes you say that, Miss Turner? Many strange things have happened recently. For instance... He's just moved me into the bedroom in which my sister died. Well, what reason did he give for changing your room? That my old one needed repainting. It didn't need it, but Dr. Roylett did need to move me into that horrible room. And other things have happened. I... I've heard the music again. Music? What music? My sister first heard it a few days before she died. I heard it myself on that dreadful night she breathed her last. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I'm terrified. Don't worry, my dear. Please don't worry anymore. <laughs> you have friends to help you now. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? No, of course not. Now, this music, does it seem to come from inside the house or outside? Well, it, it's hard to say. It, it sounds so faint. What's it like? A sort of soft droning sound. Like a flute or a pipe? Yes, it, mm -hmm. it reminds me of native music I heard during my childhood in India. India, eh? Yeah. There's one other thing that puzzles me, Mr. Holmes. Now, what's that? My sister's dying words. As she lay in my arms, she gasped out two words. Now, what were they? Band and speckled. You remember that evidence from the inquest, don't you, Dr. Watson? Yes, 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 I do. I couldn't make head or tail of it. Well, so? Fan, speckled, Indian music. Miss Stoner, do you sleep with your door and windows fastened? Yes, Mr. Holmes, but so did poor Violet. It didn't save her, though. What did you gather from your sister's dying allusion to the band, the speckled band? Well, sometimes I thought it was merely the wild talk of delirium, and sometimes that it referred to a band of people. Oh, yes. I remember that there were some gypsies in camp quite near us at the time of Violet's death. Gypsies, eh? Yes. And it occurred to me that the spotted, gaily-colored kerchiefs, which so many of them wear over their heads, might have suggested the unusual adjective which my sister used. Mr. Turner, how long is it since you heard this strange music that you've told us about? I heard it last night. Your fiancé lives to... leaves today, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, Miss Turner, I shall do everything I can to help you. 
If we were to come to Stoke Moran today, would it be possible to see over your rooms without the knowledge of your stepfather? Why, I think so. He told me this morning that he intended to take a late train home tonight. Ah, that's splendid. Watson, up with the timetable, old fellow, and look up the trains to Stoke Moran. Right, your home. That's my stepfather. I know it is. Oh, yes. Yes, there he is on the doorstep. Oh, Mr. Holmes, he's followed me. Oh, what shall I do if he finds me here? Don't worry, be... Miss Stoner. Please don't worry. There's a private exit through that room there. Watson, show the way, will you? Come along with me, my dear young lady. And, and you will come down today, Mr. Holmes? Certainly, my dear Miss Stoner. I'll telegraph you the entire time of our arrival. Goodbye and courage, my dear. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes, and thank you. Come along, Miss Stoner, quickly. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? It's a, a gentleman, sir. I told him you wouldn't see anyone without an appointment, but he... Out of the way, woman! Now, push me like that. I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes. That's all right, Mrs. Hudson. You can leave us. What kind of gentleman does he call himself pushing an old lady? So, you're Sherlock Holmes. You have the advantage of me, sir. Your name is, uh... My name, sir, is Roylott. Dr. Grimsby Roylott of Stoke Moran. Oh, yes, yes, of course. A charming place, I hear, and obviously good for the lungs. You won't trifle with me if you know what's good for you. Ah. Uh, Watson, there you are. And how was the, uh, uh, the experiment? Very successful, Holmes. Good day to you, Dr. Roylott. I haven't seen you since I gave evidence at your stepdaughter's inquest. Yes, yes, I remember you, Dr. Watson. Now listen to me, you two. My stepdaughter's been here. I placed her. What's she been saying to you? A little cold for this time of the year, isn't it? You answer me! I hear that the crocuses promise well. You dare to try and put me off, do you? I know you, you scoundrel. You're Holmes the meddler. Am I? Holmes the busybody. I believe that a man should occupy his time. Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. Uh, when you go out, close the door, won't you? There's a draft. I'll go when I've had my say. Keep your nose out of my affairs, do you hear? Oh, yes. My hearing is excellent, thank you, and your diction and delivery most forceful. But time flies, my dear doctor. Time flies, and life has its duties as well as its pleasures. Goodbye. Insolent rascal. Here. See this poker? Oh, the fire doesn't need poking, thank you, Doctor. But I, I should be obliged if you'd uh, put some more coal on for me. Mm. You laugh at me. You don't know my strength. Look. There. Your poker's bent double. And that's what I'll do to both of you. If you don't keep out of my affairs. I had a presentment that he'd slam the door. Phew. He's an ugly customer, eh, Holmes? Literally as well as figuratively. Watson, I'd be much obliged if you'd get your revolver. It may prove to be an excellent argument with a gentleman who twists iron pokers into knots. Oh, the fellow's mm. amazingly strong. Just look at it. I don't want to appear flamboyant, but, uh... Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, there we are. Great. Scott Holmes, you straighten the poker out again. Yes, it was utterly useless in its former shape. And now, Watson, the timetable will catch the next fast train to Stoke Moran. <laughs> Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm so relieved that you've come. But don't you think my stepfather might have followed you down here? Let's take that chance, Miss Stoner. A few hours' delay might mean the difference between our life and death. It was imperative that we examine this bedroom of yours before Dr. Roylott returns. Anyway, my dear, you mustn't worry any more. We're here in your house, and we're going to take good care of you, no matter what harm befalls you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. So this is the room in which your sister died, is it? Hmm, it's much as I pictured it. Uh, and Dr. Roylott's room adjoins this one, you say, Miss Turner? Yes, Doctor, on that side. The room which adjoins it on the other side is my regular bedroom. The one that's being so conveniently painted, eh? Yes. Well, let's examine this room. No trap doors or sliding panels, I suppose. It sounds solid enough, huh? Yes, I think it is. Hello, what's this? Are you aware that this bed is clamped to the floor, Miss Stoner? Why? No, no, Mr. Holmes, I didn't know that. What an extraordinary thing. Was the bed in your other room anchored also? I know, I don't think it was. Very illuminating. And this bell pull hanging against the wall above your bed. Oh, that, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, but if you want to ring. There's another one on the other wall over there. Now, why this one? Well, I, I don't know. My stepfather made a number of changes after we came here. Yes, quite a burst of activity, apparently. And it took some strange shapes. Why are you standing on the bed, Holmes? I'm curious, my dear fellow. Aha. Uh -huh. It may interest you to know that this bell rope is fastened to a brass hook. There's no wire attachment. It's a dummy. A dummy? But why? There's a small screen above it. It's a ventilator, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Yes. 
A ventilator leading into your stepfather's room. Curious. I notice there's no means of opening the ventilator on this side. It can only be operated from your stepfather's room next door. I wonder if you'd mind taking us in there. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Follow me. What do you make of it, Holmes? That's devil's work afoot, old chap. Here we are, Mr. Holmes. Mm, it's much the same as the other room. A bit bigger, perhaps. That large safe against the wall seems to be an unusual piece of bedroom furniture. What is it, Miss Dola? Uh, my stepfather's business papers. Oh, yes. You've seen inside it, then? Only once, some years ago. I remember that it was full of documents. What's this saucer of milk doing on top of it? Does Dr. Royler keep a cat? No, but he does have a cheetah and a baboon as pets. He brought them with him from India. Well, Holmes, a cheetah is just a big cat. Uh, true, but I doubt if a saucer of milk would go very far in satisfying the appetite of a cheetah. Well, I think I've seen enough. This matter is too serious for hesitation. Your life may depend upon your following my instructions, Miss Homer. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Holmes, anything. Hmm. Is that village inn I see through the uh, trees from this window? Yes, the Queen's Arms. Uh, your bedroom windows would be visible from there. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Very well, then. Watson and I will go there now and obtain accommodations. When your stepfather returns, you must confine yourself to your room on the pretense of a headache. You follow me? Perfectly. When Dr. Roylott returns for the night, you must open your bedroom window and put your lamp on the sill as a signal to us at the inn. Then withdraw quietly to your usual bedroom, the one that's being painted. I'm sure that you could manage that for one night. Of course. But what will you do? When we get your sig signal, Dr. Watson and I will come here and spend the night in your dead sister's room. We are going to solve this mystery of the dummy bell rope and the unusual ventilator and the strange music in the night. You'll hear the remainder of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to point out that at any really important dinner, you know, like when diplomats get together, you'll find wine on the table. Because for years it's been a known fact that good wine makes good food taste better. Prove that to yourself tomorrow night by having your dinner together with a glass of Petri wine. If you prefer a red wine for any meat or meat dish, try a Petri California Burgundy. That rich, hearty red Petri Burgundy is really out of this world. Now, if you'd rather have a subtle, intriguing white wine, let's say to go with chicken or fish, then try Petri California Sauternes. But so turn or burgundy, to make sure it's good, make sure it's Petri, won't you? Well, Doctor, it's a rattling good story so far. What happened next? You went to the local inn, I guess, and waited for that lantern to appear in the bedroom window at Dr. Roylott's house? That's right, Mr. Bartell. We had an early dinner at the Queen's Arms and then retired to our upstairs bedroom and sat there side by side, puffing away at our pipes, our eyes straining through the darkness for that telltale lantern to give us the signal that there was dangerous work ahead for us. As we sat there discussing the various aspects of the case, I remember that Holmes was very concerned about my own safety. You know, Watson, I, I really have some scruples about taking you with me tonight. This is an infernally dangerous business. Well, what about that poor girl, alone in the house, with that fiend, Roylet? I can handle the case by myself, old chap. I'm coming with you, Holmes. You speak of danger... We haven't seen more in those rooms than was visible to no, me. No, but uh, possibly I've deduced a little more, and I imagine you saw all that I did. No, well, I saw nothing remarkable except the bell rope, and what purpose that could answer, I confess, is more than I can imagine. You saw the ventilator, too. Yes, but I don't think it's such an unusual thing to have an opening between two rooms. It's so small that a mouse could hardly pass through it. True, but at least you will admit there was a, a curious sequence of coincidences. A ventilator is constructed, a bell cord is hung from it, a lady sleeps in a bed directly below the ventilator, a bed that is anchored to the floor. A lady dies. Well, I begin to see what you're driving at, Holmes. Look, 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 look. There's a lantern in Miss Tony's window. It's our signal, all right. Come on, Watson. Our night's vigil begins. <laughs> night. All night for foul business, Watson. Come on, through these laurel bushes. It's only another 50 yards from the house. Yes, the lantern's still burning away in the bedroom window. Yes, all the other lights are out. Including the one in Dr. Roylott's room. He must have gone to sleep. To bed, possibly, Watson, but not, I think, to sleep. Great heavens, Holmes. 
Look at that frightful creature leaping about in the moonlight. It looks like some hideous child. That's Dr. Roylott's pet baboon. But it looks positively human. Yes, probably a great deal more so than its master. Shh, shh. They directly blow the window now. This ivy provides a most convenient ladder. I'll go up first. Be careful, Holmes. Careful. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I, uh, I hope the thing's uh, strong enough to, to hold us both. He looks pretty stupid right on our backs uh, in the mud. Get, get your hand with you, Holmes. I can't quite get my leg up over this window ledge. Oh, thanks, old boy. Oh, say, phew. Now to close the window shutters. This room looks exactly like the same as it did this Shh. afternoon. These sound would be fatal to our plans. Keep the lamp covered so that if the ventilator is open from Dr. Roylott's room, no light will show from in there. That's it. Well, why are you carrying that stick home? I'm prepared for a visitor that I expect before the night is over. A visitor who heralds his entrance with faint music from an Indian pipe. You mean the music is, is a signal? Exactly, old fellow. The signal to an accomplice who can enter a room with locked doors. An accomplice who kills and leaves no trace. You mean that... Shh! No more talking, Watson. I'll sit on the edge of the bed here. You sit on that chair. Have your revolver ready in case you, you should need it. Right, you are. Have the lantern ready, too. When I shout now, turn the light pull on the top of the bell rope. You understand? Yes, perfectly. Good. Now we must wait. Perhaps for some time. But don't go to sleep, Watson, to go to sleep. Your very life may depend on it. Messenger of death. Have your lantern ready, Watson. No, Watson, no! Great heavens, it's a snake slithering down the bell rope. Ah, you can't get it with that stick holes out of the way. Let me get a shot at it. I'm going to drive it back the way it came. Get out. Ah, there it goes. Back through the ventilator. Oh. What a fiendish plan. I think the devil has turned on its master. Come on, Watson, into Dr. Roylott's room. Dr. Roylott! Dr. Roylott! Dr. Dr. Good Lord Holmes. Look at him sprawled on the bed. Look at his eyes. Yes. And see what is coiled around his forehead. It's the snake. Yes, the band. The speckled band. He's dead, Holmes. Yes. He's been bitten by the deadliest snake in the world. The Indian swamp arrow. Deadly fangs produce death within ten seconds. Well, Watson... Violence does, in truth, recoil upon the violent. And the schemer falls into the pit, which he digs for another. What should we do now, Holmes? We must remove the macabre headgear from the dead doctor and return the snake to its den. Ah, then I suggest that we tell Miss Stoner that there's no more danger under this roof. After that, we can turn the matter over to the local police. Our work is done. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you brought me back here to Baker Street. Turner, it would have been inhuman to leave you in that house of horror and death. We have a spare bedroom, and Mrs. Hudson is a motherly and understanding woman, and I can assure you that Dr. Watson and I will be delighted to have you stay with us here until you've decided on your future plans. Yes, of course we will, my dear. As a matter of fact, it would be rather refreshing to have a, a touch of youth about the place. You're both so <laughs> kind. Mr. Holmes, I think it's wonderful how you foiled my stepfather's devilish plans. Yes, wasn't it a remarkable example of logical deduction? No, it wasn't, old fellow. At first, um, your mention of the gypsies, Miss Stoner, and the use of the word ban put me on an entirely wrong scent. However, when we examined the fatal room, I drew the obvious conclusion. You mean the dummy bell rope, the ventilator, and the immovable bed? Yes, old fellow. It instantly gave rise to the suspicion that the rope was there as a bridge for something coming through the ventilator and traveling to the bed. I once thought of a snake. 
And when I saw the saucer of milk on top of the safe, my suspicions crystallized into certainties. Oh, it was a fiendish plot. Yes, and an extremely clever one, too. Exactly. My stepfather must have trained the seat to return to him when he played the music. Yes, he put it through the ventilator, and with the certainty that it would crawl down the rope and land on the bed, it might or might not bite the occupant. Perhaps she might escape every night for a week, but sooner or later, she must fall a victim. Thank heaven I came to you, Mr. Holmes. Amen to that, you Mr. Holmes. You know, Holmes, if you hadn't lashed at the snake with your stick, I bet it wouldn't have turned back on its master. True, old chap. In that way, I am no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimsby Rylett's death. <laughs> but I, I can't say it's a fact that's likely to be too heavily on my conscience. <laughs> Doctor, that was quite a fascinating story. You know something? I, I'm not exactly a coward, but no kidding. My toes really curl when I get mixed up with snakes. Oh, Oof. I'm not alone in that respect, Mr. Bartell. I must admit that I like to have a revolver and at least 20 feet between me and any snake that wants to cross my path. <laughs> well, if you want a revolver in 20 feet, I'll take a cannon in 20 miles. <laughs> it's fortunate that you're a wine expert, Mr. Bartell, not a detective. I'm afraid you wouldn't... Uh... Shall we say fine detecting to your liking? We certainly shall say it. <laughs> and incidentally, I'm not a wine expert, Doctor. All I know about wine is that it either tastes good or it doesn't. And I also know that Petri wine always tastes good. The Petri family sees to that. The name Petri on the label is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. And they know how to make it good because they've been making fine wine for generations. Handing down from father to son, from father to son, every secret, every skill of the winemaker's art. Yes, the Petri family took time to bring you good wine. That's why, no matter what type of wine you wish, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you planning to tell us next well, week? Well, now, let me see. Now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm... I think I'll tell you an adventure that took place at a gambling casino in the south of France. It's a strange story of sudden tragedy and death. I call it The Adventure of the Double Zero. Sounds swell. We'll all be listening. You know, Mr. Bartell, before I go, I want to say that every one of our friends bought war bonds to help our boys win the war. Now let's all buy victory bonds to help bring our boys back home again. Yes, and let's buy victory bonds to make sure that the men who were wounded will get the finest possible care. Those same victory bonds will help make the G.I. Bill of Rights a success, too. And they'll help provide for the families of those men who gave everything, including their lives. The men of our armed forces finished their job. Now let's finish ours. Buy victory bonds. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is an adaptation of the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Speckled Band. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>